Welcome back to Agritector's podcast, Locally Grown In, a podcast on a mission to help entrepreneurs grow your food locally. This week, I'm your host, Jeffrey Landau. This episode, we are exploring Miami, Florida, and we'll be discussing the opportunities and challenges in this city by looking at existing data and sharing our analysis and talking to stakeholders in the space. I'm here with Brianna Zagami, my co-host for today's episode. Brianna, how's it going? It's going great. We just got back from a week in sunny Miami, Florida. We attended the Sustainability Digitalization Leadership Conference, and we got to speak with two inspiring individuals, Lisa Merkel of Box Greens, a hydroponic farm in Little Haiti, a neighborhood in Miami, and Art Fredrich of Urban Oasis Project. And it was cool because I got to actually visit Lisa's farm. It was great to hear her story, learn a little bit about how her and her sister got the farm started, and then actually see the success that they're having with their farm. So you'll be hearing from both of them in a little bit. But first, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in South Florida and in Miami, your home state? Well, Brianna, let me ask you a question. When you think of Florida, what is the first agricultural product that you think of? Citrus. Citrus. Oranges. Mm -hmm. The Sunshine State with the citrus all around. Some sugarcane in there as well. Unfortunately, what we're seeing in Florida, and this has been going on since the 2000s, is citrus greening, an incurable bacterial disease that the state has been battling since the late 1990s. The state's orange crop dropped about 14% due to the effects of citrus greening, which has led to the loss of production, a.k.a. dying trees. And Jeff, as climate change worsens, can we expect these diseases and more to continue to wipe out uh, agricultural production of citrus and other crops in Florida? I think the, the pressures of climate change will continue to increase the amount of pests and disease flourish not just throughout Florida, but throughout states around the U.S. and around the world. What I think is in particular interesting about Florida, and especially South Florida, is the type of climate and land that the the southern state has to offer. Yeah, so we learned a little bit about the diversity of the land in Florida and some of the challenges with the soil, particularly in South Florida. Yeah, so what you see in South Florida is that the soil really consists of rock, sand, marl, and muck. You know, people call this Miami limestone, which is this alkaline calcium carbonate, which is high in pH, maybe somewhere between 7.8 to 8.1, and it doesn't really retain water too well or nutrients, so it makes growing plants a real challenge for the environment. And what I think is interesting to, to learn about and what you'll hear in this interview later on is you know the types of technologies that growers are using to combat these these climate conditions whether it's from the soil or from the weather or from disease and pests and I think what you'll hear from box greens from Lisa Merkel is you know how they're using controlled environment agriculture to mitigate some of those issues so they can produce produce for their community and for their customers. So why does the hospitality industry in Miami make this local food movement more valuable? What we're seeing in the the hospitality industry, and I think this is for lots of different industries, but particularly for South Florida, is that, you know, lettuce salad mixes are uh, typically a cold weather crop. And in South Florida, those are pretty difficult to grow given the heat, the humidity, and when you're looking at hotels, cruise ships, any type of hospitality business, the economies of scales that they're dealing with, the quantity that they need to supply to their customers is is quite large. So if you're looking at local production, you know, you might not be using a traditional soil-based cultivation system because of the the soil and the climate of South Florida, but what you could do is create a controlled environmental agricultural system, such as a greenhouse or maybe even a vertical farm that can produce the yields that these customers might be willing to purchase at. What's interesting about Miami and Miami-Dade County, which the city of Miami is a part of, is that they only allow permitted farmers markets to take place in these urban 
center districts. Now, there are only 12 of them within the county, and it's quite limiting in the growth of the urban agricultural food movement if you can only have farmer's markets in specific areas that only certain residents have access to. So how can cities, especially cities that are trying to bolster and improve local food infrastructure, how can they create policies that cultivate and foster growth and development when it comes to food production? I think, Brianna, you know, we, you and I could talk about this all day, about the challenges South Florida is facing when it comes to urban agriculture. But let's dive in with our interviewees and hear straight from the local leaders and let our listeners decide on how they can learn from these experts in the field. So I think with that, let's turn on over to the interviews. Today we have Art Friedrich and Lisa Merkel join us on the podcast. We're here in Miami, Florida, discussing all things urban agriculture. Art, Lisa, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for coming to Miami. Yeah. All it's the way. October and it's hot. It <laughs> is hot. Um, I guess to kick us off, maybe we'll start with you, Lisa. We'd love to hear more about your story, the company you founded, and take it from there. Sure. So I'm co-founder of Box Greens. We're an indoor hydroponic farm based in Little Haiti, which is a historically underserved neighborhood in central Miami. We take used shipping containers and convert them into fully operational indoor farms that grow lettuce, eight different varieties of lettuce. And we also have the capacity to grow microgreens, which we do a few, and herbs. So we take these shipping containers and outfit them with racks and LED lighting and an HVAC system and an irrigation system to control an environment to create an optimal environment for the plants to grow. And each container produces up to 800 heads of lettuce a week. Wow, that's incredible. It's a lot of lettuce. And it's incredibly beautiful. There's no pesticides, there's no herbicides. We monitor pH and nutrients. The nutrients aren't organic or not organic. They're minerals. We monitor everything using technology. Myself and my co-founder felt it was really important that we have a basic understanding. So in addition to the technology we use, we're also hands-on and know how to mix nutrients and take manual readings. This type of farming uses 90% less water than traditional agriculture. One container takes up a footprint of 320 square feet, and it's the equivalent of one to two acres of traditional farmland. So we're able to sit on a small footprint in Little Haiti and we provide a hyper-local product to restaurants and direct to consumer. So we're at the farmer's market on Saturdays. Whatever is not reserved by chefs or already harvested that week for chefs, we pack it up and that's our opportunity to work direct to consumer, talk to people about what we're doing and why, create an understanding around the value. And in that position, we also have a fresh, real food product that is accessible for individuals that are using SNAP benefits food stamps. So that's like a little snapshot of of what I'm doing down in Miami every day. (laughs) Awesome, 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 awesome. And turn over to you, Art. Please tell us a bit more about the Urban Oasis Project. Yeah, sure. Um, So I moved to Miami 10 years ago and was really shocked to find really no local food movement happening. Very few farmers markets literally three community gardens around the entire county. And I've lived a bunch of different places, Boston, St. Louis, Cincinnati. And so it's just really surprised by that real lack um, of local food availability and a culture around that and of supporting local vendors and local farmers. So we started Urban Oasis Project to help build a, a local food movement and make it just begin with one that was accessible and available to everybody. So we planted gardens with people at their homes as a way to kind of create food leaders in the community. And then we were asked to start a farmer's market. So we did that and we made it a priority from the beginning to be able to accept SNAP benefits, food stamps, public assistance for, you know, the lowest income folks to be able to buy food. And then we got funding to be able to double the value of those benefits because we're really focused on making a food movement that's accessible and available to everybody. We really believe that good healthy food is kind of a right for all people. So we've been running farmers markets for nine years 
And that's really given us a platform to create a space to support local farms, actually create authentic farmers markets, which is really um, challenging to do. Miami is a very young city, a very new city, very rapidly changing city, really trying to build an economic base for themselves, which a lot of times farming is not considered part of that. And the county has a long agricultural heritage, and we're really losing that very rapidly. The forces of gentrification are moving around the city very quickly, and typically it's not seen that there's a lot of money in agriculture. So we're losing our farmland rapidly. So there's a lot of mixing challenges going on. Yeah, you know, I think those challenges we're seeing across the board, you know, throughout the U.S. and in other parts of the world as well. And I think that leads me to my next question for you, Lisa, is, you know, why, what made you and your co-founder get into this business? Yeah, so our backgrounds, neither one of us were farmers when we came to this business. Cheryl, my partner, has a background in food distribution. I have a background in fashion and health and wellness. I'm a certified yoga teacher and health coach. So, I've had an an interest in food and where it comes from and how it affects the environment and how that environment affects our health. Cheryl came to me with a video of a company that takes shipping containers and turns them into farms. I was like, whoa, that's so cool. You could create a, you could grow lettuce in Miami, Florida year round, which is not possible without a controlled environment. And one thing led to another, and we dove into research. I visited farms, a lot of farms on the Northeast, both indoor controlled environment farms, but also urban farms to investigate what individuals were doing, were successful and failing. By luck, we were introduced to an engineer who's a product designer by trade, but had actually designed one of the first box farms. And I use the term box farm to talk about one of these shipping containers turned into a farm. And he now just travels all over the world building indoor farms. And he agreed to design and work with us. And he continues on board as an advisor and a consultant. At the time, I was living in New York City, facing dealing with some health challenges. I was diagnosed with cancer. And developing the business and the business plan was a way... My business partner and my sister convinced me to move back to Miami and then a way to get into community and things that I'm passionate about that have a real purpose. So we use the business as a platform to talk about the climate crisis, which is affecting Miami. I don't want to say in a unique way, but in an exceptional way. And we use it as a platform to talk about food access You know, we actually are, we set up at Arts Farmers Market on Saturday, and it's like coincidence that we're here together. But the attraction was that they're set up to take these benefits, and that creates a sense of access to the food that we're growing. And ultimately, we want to be able to scale and get to a point where it isn't a luxury product for chef driven restaurants, but it's a healthy food source that is better for the environment and good for people's health. Well, that's definitely incredible to hear, you know, your own personal story and the challenges that you face in developing this business, given that we, you know, are in this emerging new niche of urban agriculture from a commercial aspect. And I think going over to you, Art, you know, what kind of challenges have you seen trying to establish a farmer's market in South Florida and maybe talk about the type of individuals that attend the market and you know, how you engage and interact with them on a a day-to-day basis. I think also like how, how you basically had to start this movement down here. So what were the challenges in starting a local food movement? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first I want to play off of what Lisa brought up about climate change. I mean, that's such a huge issue. You know, we really wanted to start what we were doing to focus on kind of our three pillars, which is environmental sustainability and public health and creating a local economy. So that's kind of the three things that we always are trying to bring together with our work. So being able to support small farms, new farms, and innovative farms like Lisa's Box Greens is, you know, really at the core of what we're doing. We see a lot of people that are very interested in those things and in sustainability. And it's been, you know, a long process of kind of uh, bringing those people together at the farmer's market. And the, the market, in a way, gives them a voice and, and helps them find community to work together, create collaborations, and, you know, kind of live out some of their ideals of having less of a negative impact on the environment, being able to support, you know, local people that are trying to innovate. But there's been definitely roadblocks. I mean, the policy is always a huge issue. 
So when we started, there wasn't a farmer's market ordinance in the city or the county that allowed farmer's markets. Uh, so we first helped fight with a group called Roots in the City that was operating in Overtown, which is, you know, historic, well, in recent history, one of the most impoverished neighborhoods, which is right by downtown, but, you know, really suffered when highways were put in and cut the area in half. And so it took this historically black neighborhood that was a thriving center of culture and just chopped it into four totally separated sections and destroyed the economy of it. So Roots in the City had been an urban agriculture project from 12, 13 years ago that had a farmer's market there. They couldn't get a permit to run their farmer's market in front of their farm. So uh, some folks had put together a Miami Food Policy Council and they were able to advocate, create, write a policy that the city then adopted. And then we helped work with the county a few years later to uh, make that policy um, a similar policy for the entire county. So advocacy is always super important for actually, you know, changing the policies to, to make conditions where, you know, we can innovate and thrive. And it can be really difficult for local governments that are more focused on purely economic growth in one dimension and, and in one regard to, you know, look at like these other important things that are really important for public health and for community. So we still feel like, you know, at best, we receive benign neglect from local government, <laughs> and we're happy with that. Um, and um, but we are starting to see, you know, a little bit from one of our commissioner's office with Legion Park. So we're throwing a big fall festival this weekend. So we bring local artists, speakers, and musicians once a month to the farmers market. Really engaging in some placemaking, so creating a farmer, the farmer's market not just as a place for economic commerce, but for that community growth, conversations between people to really build a stronger knit community, which was really at the core of improving the quality of life. You know, a lot of times when we talk about food and the food systems, we're focused on that one part, but, you know, really the ultimate goal all the time should be like improving our actual quality of life, our lived experience. And, you know, that's really... You know, I really feel like at the core, what Urban Oasis Project is doing is more of a spiritual thing and helping people create more value and meaning in their lives. And that's why we also bring things back to planting gardens with people on a sliding scale basis, because connecting people with where their food is coming from, you know, to some degree, they have to like grow a little bit themselves to get that experience. Well, I definitely think that resonates with me, you know, the, the spiritual component of, you know, creating this local food movement and really, you know, connecting people with their food and with the farmers that grow their food. And I think for you, Lisa, you know, what kind of experiences do you have, you know, at the farmer's market, you know, when people come up to your stand and look at your product and you know, what kind of questions are they asking and what are you telling them? Well, so before I answer that, I want to reflect on a moment for like the mood of the farmer's market because it's ridiculously awesome. Like as somebody who moved back to Miami two years ago after living in New York City where there is an, an energetics of community just by the density of individuals living together, I feel a sense of community and warmth and the food that arts um, organization offers is ridiculously beautiful. So there's like a robust offering of locally grown food. Last week, there were a lot of avocados and star fruits and dragon fruits and turmeric and ginger. Okay, your farmer's markets are better than ours <laughs> already. <laughs> well, so there's I mean, no apples and there's no grapes. Right, right, right. I don't it's, care. I'll, it wasn't, I'll give you all my apples wait, for your avocados. But there was that like red sorrel thing. What was that? Oh, long, cranberry, cranberry hibiscus. Oh, it was cranberry hibiscus. So, which kind of looked like fall, but otherwise, it doesn't really resemble fall as we're in October but this like beautiful and there's the mushrooms I don't know where the mushrooms are coming from but like that's ridiculously gorgeous and then the mood of all the vendors are um like with passion with purpose and like you feel it it there's such an experience about being connected to your food by purchasing from not necessarily a, a farmer, like in my situation I am, but somebody who's a local food producer. So like the bread man who makes these ridiculously beautiful breads and dips and whatnot that he bakes himself, that's what I call nutritious food, right? It's mm -hmm. not like gluten or gluten-free or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just like made with heart and soul. Mm -hmm. And I walk up and he's like, you got to try this. You got to try that. And I'm going to save you one of these. Don't forget when you come back. And so it's just an exceptional experience. I We wake up at 6 a.m. on Saturday to like load up the car to come out. And 
like I love it. I love it. It's just a great part. Of it's what an we're exceptional doing. community that's grown, especially. I'm, I mean, I'm just so proud of the international representation. I mean, so many immigrants. Most of our vendors are people of color. A lot of gay and lesbian trans folks that are vendors and working at the market. And so, you know, we're super proud of that diversity. Mm-hmm. And it really reflects the community of Miami and the spirit of Miami, yeah, too. Yeah, and it's, like, super inclusive. Like, I feel super, like, everyone coming in feels super welcome. So that's that explains our experience. Mm-hmm. We, in four weeks we've developed a following and we sell out before the market closes every week individuals are super super engaged so i you know as someone walks by like hey you want to try a sample it's fresh local lettuce it's the farm is down the street here's a photograph we grow in a shipping container here's what it looks like this is how hydroponic farming is different and they get to taste it and they taste the difference i try to get kids to try it i have so like there's a whole educational component to your it's, side i mean like i'm just so into it i can't help it mm-hmm. i started a little instagram like insta story section that's i call it little lettuce lovers and it's just i try to get little because i want to take a picture i try to get little kids to eat it and then the families get engaged and like how do you get your children to eat fresh fruits and vegetables and what else is here and did you see like art has star fruit and it's you know like that's a really great fruit for kids and we really use it as an opportunity to educate people about what we're doing because our purpose is to create value to understand where the food is coming from and maybe inspire people to understand like why that is important to ask that question i usually drop like the truth bomb and i say you know the lettuce you get at the grocery store was grown in california probably three or four weeks ago harvested we harvested this yesterday you know it's like crazy. what it's do you crazy. think you know you can taste the difference the education and the amount of learning that I think needs to be done to really, sh- you know, bring everyone up to speed in our community and, you know, nationally is, you know, we're, we're definitely far behind. And I think what you both are doing and highlighting these stories and creating this sense of community really kind of elevates the sense of what urban agriculture and local food systems can do for people in their cities. Going back to the challenges, I mean, what has been really difficult for us is that there are really so few small farmers in South Florida, um, especially in Miami-Dade County. And so we've had, you know, when I came here, there's this proliferation of so-called farmer's markets. Most of them had no farmers. They had not even any local produce. If there was stuff, it wasn't labeled. You couldn't tell what was local and what was not local. So that was a big reason why we started producing farmer's markets and, you know, really prioritizing authenticity and source-specific labeling. So what we do as Urban Oasis Project um, in producing the farmer's markets is we also aggregate produce. Um, So we've run two different farms over the course of the last 10 years, um, one of which was a really cool project in partnership with the Homeless Trust and was is called Verde Gardens and it's still running under different management now um, by a different nonprofit and that was creating permanent assisted housing to house formerly homeless families and then we ran a farm and a market 22 acres that we got certified organic Mm -hmm. to increase the amount of local organically grown vegetables and also to create a center where we could offer jobs to these formerly homeless folks and give them training and then have healthy food access for them right there grown on site and so that's still running by a group called redland ahead and we still get to buy the produce from them to bring to these different markets around the county because we as an organization found that managing a market or managing multiple markets Mm -hmm. uh, we have five different markets that we are part of or run right now and managing our own farm was too much and that really what miami needed was you know these services of aggregating produce but really doing that in a way that respects the farmers and highlights them, pays them a fair wage for their product. You know, like we don't really quibble on wholesale prices for the most part. I mean, like, you know, I make it clear to folks that I have to be able to mark this up and sell it so that I can cover our costs. And I have to be able to convince consumers that this is worth, you know, whatever I'm going to have to charge. But, you know, A lot of the farms that do operate that are able to sell to us and they pay their workers fair wages. So, you know, sometimes the expense is higher. Um, But we also do have great deals as well, you know, depending on the season. Our growing season is just getting started. Uh, You know, we mainly grow from October until May here. The summer, we stay open year-round with our markets because we have a great fruit season. So we have 
the mangoes and avocados and jackfruit and weird things like Monstera Delicioso and Gambooge <laughs> and all kinds of things people have never heard of. So we have a lot of fun making people try new things and expanding their palates. But the aggregation bit is a really kind of unique thing that we focus on. And then we figure out ways to highlight that priority. So last year, the woman that mainly runs the organization with me, Chantel, she's also a chef. So she started a Farmer's Direct dinner series. So it's a more affordable farm-to-table dinner. So we, it's about $40. And about 40 people, we bring all the produce from one farm, and we bring the farmer as well. So while Chantel cooks and plates a beautiful four-course plant-based meal all from one farm, I do little talks in between the courses where mainly I'm interviewing the farmers and having a kind of a live interview with the farmer in front of everyone about their challenges, their inspiration, you know, what motivates them, where they plan to go in the next few years. So we were able to do seven of those last year, and it's just a really fun way to really create an authentic experience which, you know, so often I feel like now local food has become such a hot topic. It can be really hard even now to find the authenticity within it. There's so many people that are into greenwashing their events, greenwashing their company, you know, presenting these kind of things that people will pay extra for thinking they're getting something special. And it isn't always when you look into it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Lisa, moving a bit more into the the technical components of box farming, container farming, you know, can you walk our listeners through, you know, what decisions you made to to grow in a container farm, and what the the future, the scale of your business will be? Are you are you looking to stick with container farms? Do you think you'll pivot into other types of systems? Talk to us about that. Yeah. So I mentioned before, we did a ton, a ton, a ton of research, and we looked at large-scale indoor farms and what they're doing, and these companies that are doing these smaller box farms. And one thing we learn and really appreciate, specifically being in Miami, is that the opportunity to take an insulated shipping container that's typically used to transport food all over the world and repurpose it as a farm has a lot of benefits. And one is the size and the actual physical structure facilitates temperature and humidity control. Whereas it's a larger challenge for a very large scale farm to accomplish that. Not impossible, there's different challenges involved. We love the idea that a shipping container or a group of shipping containers has a small footprint and we can maintain a hyperlocal presence by putting what I call pods. So, you know, kind of like the dream, I can't say there's a concrete plan right now, but is to do pods, so a group of like five or six or seven of these shipping containers together in proximity to where people eat, live, work, maybe on university campuses, there's lots of universities down here, maybe at a hospital system, like huge, huge hospitals, how do they feed their employees, and then the food that's actually in the hospital for the patients, or even large hospitality groups. So you know, a huge industry in Miami is hospitality. So perhaps the idea of putting two or three shipping containers in a parking lot or on a roof to supply the food for the restaurants and those hotels. So there's kind of like all these opportunities if we have these kind of like little modular farms. Our advantage of working with an engineer is that we participated in the design and it's a unique design and we call it future proof. So we have the ability to snap out the lighting in a zone if we find a source that has lighting that's exceptional for basil. You know, we can snap it out and repurpose that lighting in another container or somewhere else in the container. Same thing with like our pumps and our irrigation system. It's all malleable and the industry is moving so quickly. And, you know, that's across the whole chain within the industry. So it's like the people that are making the lighting to the people that are providing the expertise around the growing. Like there's a gazillion resources to help with the technology we use in the container or even an online university that turned us on to growing microgreens, which we kind of taught ourselves via YouTube. So that's kind of like some unique aspects and that's specific around the shipping container. We're not, you know, like married, married to it. Should an opportunity show up where we have opportunity to move into a large warehouse and, you know, we decide to work with our engineer to kind of suit that space or that need, that's an option as well. It's also with shipping containers. We could actually drive them into a warehouse. Mm -hmm. 
and park them off in a corner. They're also stackable, and that's relevant to you know a smaller footprint and providing food where people live, eat, work, play, love. You know, for us, there's no one single solution to growing food. There's no one single type of operation. It's a collection mm -hmm. of operations that are really designed and geared towards the environment and context that they're located in. You know, another question for you both is, you know, for the aspiring entrepreneur that's looking to start their first farm or is looking to revise or create policy or create a farmer's market, you know, what advice would you give um, in accomplishing these, these feats? <laughs> it takes so patience hard. and it takes a say. lot of hard work. And unfortunately, a lot of times it takes connections. A lot of new farmers are coming at it and they don't have a lot of financial resources to begin with. And there really is very little support for very new, very small farmers. And a lot of people don't realize how much education and knowledge it really takes to be successful. Being a farmer is one of the most complex industries, even though it's one of the most underpaid. You know, you have to know business, you have to know, you know, marketing skills, you have to know all this biology and chemistry. I mean, there's so many different aspects to it. Mm -hmm. It can be really challenging. So what comes to mind for me is the mood of service. For an individual to step in and say, here are my talents and here's where I can fulfill a need. And when I say service, I don't mean work for free and live on an ashram, although that might be a great way to gain experience, but really hone in on like what your skills on it and how that can help people. And then on top of that is calling in advisors and a support network, which is similar to what Art was saying. But I think, you know, we're on a wave right now. It's incredible. The demand is way beyond what we can actually provide. So we're strategizing how to grow. Ton of support. And we've proven that what we are doing is actually of service to the community in multiple ways. And that's how we have kind of garnered that support and the resources that we can, you know, move forward and take another step and begin to expand, you know, the opportunity to attend events like this, SDL, and connect and inquire and learn and be inspired, I think is an aspect that is part of that whole, like creating a team of advisors around you. That's awesome. All right, Lisa, for our South Florida listeners, tell them where can they find you? Where is the farmer's market? When is it? And how can they get there? So for direct-to-consumer, we're at the Legion Park Farmer's Market every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., and that's Arts Market. Yeah, and that's at 66th Street and Biscayne Boulevard. And then Urban Oasis Project also has other markets. We have Market Mondays, uh, Monday nights at the Arsht Center, so that's 13th and Biscayne. Uh, we're at the Tropical Park Farmers Market every Saturday as well from 9 to 3. On Sundays, we're at the Surfside Farmers Market out on North Beach in Surfside. And then we're going to be opening a new market real soon at Vizcaya beginning in January. Awesome, awesome. Well, Nope. Go ahead. So I didn't. So we're served at restaurants. That part I didn't mention. Yeah, so which restaurants? We, well, we highlight on Instagram who we're with. We're really proud that we're serving at Zap the Baker, um, which everyone in Miami knows. And there's a storefront down in Wynwood. Um, and then there are a handful of other chef-driven restaurants that we are supplying, and we post that on Instagram. What's your Instagram handle so everyone can follow? Box Greens. B o x g r e e n s. All right. Awesome. Well, listeners, you heard it here. For our South Florida listeners, make sure you check out both Art and Lisa. We have Lisa with Box Greens and Art with the Urban Oasis Project. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again for tuning in to Locally Grown In. Thanks, Jeff. Always a pleasure hanging out with your fam in Florida. Brianna, it was an absolute pleasure. I hope to all our listeners they enjoy this episode of Locally Grown in Miami. Please make sure to add us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts, comments, feedback, critiques. Let us know.